a blind, a blind halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now, it really is not saying clearly that this is what was so, but this is what the people thought that were at Bethesda and uh, at that really outdoor pool. And, uh, you know, uh, the water is fed from the Gihon Spring and it would uh, go to the pool of Siloam and uh, some uh, might go to Bethesda, but in that area, there was uh, underground a uh, gushing water. In fact, uh, Gihon Spring is uh, thought to be the uh, one of the four great gushing springs. That is, uh, the water comes out it, with a lot of energy for a while, then it stops. Then after a while, it starts again. So they really, that's why they built the Siloam in order to house this water that would come out. So uh, in that area, the water came at certain moments. And uh, apparently the water was disturbed at the pool of Bethesda periodically. And uh, they thought that an angel um, might be the one stirring up the water and whoever would touch that water first would get healed. And so uh, the, some people would just stay around there really day and night uh, waiting for this. Of course, Bethesda, uh, Beth or Bet uh, is a house and the uh, Hasid uh, or such is thought to be mercy. It's the pool of mercy. And uh, we have Bethesda, Maryland and the Bethesda Naval Hospital where the president is attended. Presidents of, uh, are taken care of at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Washington, DC. And uh, this man, Jesus is about to do one of the great miracles of healing. Now, Jesus may have healed, well, I shouldn't say may, Jesus healed, no doubt, thousands of people, because in certain, uh, in many places, it says they brought him, apparently for hours, they brought him all their sick, and he healed them. And so, you know, in a town, he, he occasionally may have healed uh, uh, many, many more, and at certain times he was even exhausted in his human body after that. And he went off uh, to rest and to pray. Well, uh, but John includes a certain number of miracles. Actually, the New Testament describes about 30 miracles in great detail. But again, Jesus healed hundreds and probably thousands because it says in many places he uh, healed all of their sick and they came to him. But John says, remember, John said, these are written that you might believe. So uh, here, John gives us great details because it's a remarkable uh, miracle that cannot be gainsaid or talked away. Now, you remember a few years ago, uh, how should I say, maybe 20 years ago, on TV, there was a popular time of uh, uh, faith healers. And uh, sometimes they would touch somebody in the forehead and they would be, quote, slain in the spirit and fall down. And uh, people would wonder, uh, are, are these really healing? Now, by the way, I believe God heals. And we just prayed for a sister. And I believe God answers prayer and God heals and God can heal somebody instantly and God can heal uh, using you know, medicine and doctors. Uh, but uh, when the, some of these things on TV were going on and then they would ask for a lot of money, uh, people had their doubts because they were, uh, it just happened fast and you didn't know, could the person, uh, was it psychological, was it whatever, all kinds of questions. But here, John gives us this, that we might know the absolute certainty of the case that uh, this person was 38 years. Here's a regular person who hangs around. I remember my, my son goes to, a lawyer goes to the Fort Lauderdale courthouse and he would tell about certain 
uh, people who would be begging money, who would be regulars. And uh, some sat on the third step and some on the seventh step and some on the left side by the bushes, but they were regulars. Every day they were there. Well, here was a regular. And so sooner or later, everybody kind of knew the person. Oh, that's uh, whatever Ezra or uh, whatever name he had. And uh, uh, he's a regular and he can't walk and uh, maybe give him some money, give him something. And it says he was 38 years, uh, he couldn't walk. So this is no psychological problem. This is a, a real case. And uh, when Jesus saw him in verse six, lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, wilt thou be made whole? Now, notice Jesus, always does the kind thing and the right thing. If Jesus just healed them without saying anything to him, the person might think, well, the angel came and uh, even though the water wasn't moved, I was fortunate or who knows what. So it had to be made clear that Jesus is the one who's going to heal him. By the way, I remember J. Vernon McGee said about this uh, uh, healing. He said that this man, uh, his problem was he was looking at the water instead of looking at the Savior. Well, uh, easily said. And uh, verse 7, the impotent man, or we would say the crippled man, answered him and sir, uh, said, Sir, I don't, I don't have any, uh, any man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another step is down before me. A lot of people in life and all of us, but a lot of people, it's like, why do I have this problem? Why is this man impotent? Why is this man crippled? And others uh, can do tumbles and the uh, loops and the Olympics. They're so healthy. And why do some people have all kinds of helpers and I don't have a helper? Well, we, we leave that to, in a sense, the sovereignty of God. And we, we, we have to pray in our own situation. There are always people that have more money than we do, more athletic ability, more health, more success. <clears throat> and you just have to say, wherever God has allowed me to be, you know, may, may God use me, may God help me, and uh, may I pray to glorify him in whatsoever situation I am. And, uh, but he says, here I am. I don't have any, any helper. Uh, and Jesus said, rise, verse eight, John five, verse eight, rise, take up thy bed and walk. What magnificent words. Of course, John would, was aided by the Holy Spirit to remember these things, but you'd never forget it. Here, this crippled man for life, Jesus looks at him and, uh, says, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Uh, why did Jesus pick this man? Well, he certainly picked this man in this case. Remember, he's healed many, many. He's healed multitudes. But here was somebody that uh, the Pharisees were around. It was Jerusalem. It was a public place. He was about to do a miracle that nobody could deny. It was public. Notice it's done publicly a long time illness, and uh, there are many witnesses, and nobody else could, could help him. And verse nine says, immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, Isaiah chapter 35, verse six, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 35, six describes the days of the Messiah, as he could be the blessing. And in the days of the Messiah, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, the lepers will be cleansed. And Jesus here takes a lame man and makes him walk. And the, the kind of prediction of the Messiah, Isaiah 35, 6. And it says immediately the man, uh, this isn't psychological, he, he, he got up, he took up his bed, we're not talking about a four-poster bed. We're talking about uh, 
what we would call a mat. Probably had a mat that he rolled out. Now, and maybe his family uh, left him there every morning. We don't know. Did he camp there? Did he spend the night? Uh, very likely, uh, a family member dropped him off every day. He was a regular, and he had a mat, and uh, maybe uh, uh, some people bought some food, but they didn't stay with him. He didn't have anybody to put him in the water. But now he's healed by our Lord Jesus. And uh, the Lord Jesus tells him to take up your bed, but it says it was the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath, the Pharisees were religious, but they didn't really love God. Their religion was one of uh, having a list. You know, in the Talmud, there are three volumes in Hebrew and in the English translation, about 600 pages each. In other words, about 1,800 pages in the Talmud of rules for the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees were the religious policemen, in a sense. Pharisee, uh, Pharisee means separate one in Hebrew. And they, their religion was to watch everybody who did not tithe, who ate before they tithe this or that, who uh, reaped a field and did not tithe it, uh, who on the Sabbath walked uh, more than they permitted 1,200 steps because the ark was 1,200 paces in front of the, the march. They had all these rules and they had so many rules that only the scribes and the Pharisees were, could really keep track of them all. But to them, you couldn't lift a thing. Now, Jesus, our Lord, I've said this before, Jesus, our Lord, could have easily said to the man, you've been here 38 years. Today is Shabbos. As Americans would announce it's Sabbath, as English people. In Israel, they say Shabbat. See, it's SVT. Shabbat, Sabbath. Jesus could easily say it's Shabbat. Uh, we, we don't do a healing or anything work on Sabbath, but can, uh, will you be here tomorrow? Hey, I was there 38 years. Uh, I'll come around tomorrow, and tomorrow when it's not Sabbath, I'll heal you. He could have said that, and the Pharisees would have nodded. And by the way, it's easily, especially today, to worry about pleasing the crowd and worrying about, well, what are they going to say if I do this? What are they going to say if I do that? But uh, Jesus, in his holiness and in his divinity, uh, is showing us in his holiness, in his kindness, in his goodness, that you can do good on the Sabbath. Now, mind you, he's not building the house for a man and holy wood and all that, but Jesus wants to show that true religion is not just catching people who break the rules. But if we really love God and love his people, we, we can do good in the Sabbath. You can do something nice for someone on the Sabbath. You can visit uh, uh, a person who uh, needs visiting and prayer. You can help a homeless person. You can, you can do something good on the Sabbath. And because, remember when they asked him, Jesus said, the Father worketh till now, and so I work. In other words, uh, God does good on the Sabbath, and God sends rain on the Sabbath, and uh, you can pull an ox out of the, the Bible says, an ox out of the pit on the Sabbath. So if you can pull an ox out of the pit, a man is worth more than an ox. You can certainly heal a man. So Jesus, while well, he could have done it the next day, <coughs> does it on the Sabbath to show them that God is good, and I'm good, and we can do good on the Sabbath. And the Jews therefore said, verse 10, unto him, and they used the word Jews then as the, the idea of the people from Judea. Today, the word Jew comes, uh, applies to Jewish people from any tribe. Paul said he was a Jew, and he came from Tarsus. He was a tribe of Benjamin, not Judah. 
But anyway, uh, they said uh, it is Sabbath day, it's not lawful to carry thy bed. And uh, later it says Jesus saw him, verse 14. And Jesus found him in the temple, and you see he's in the temple, that's great, he's, he's no doubt he's there to thank God for the miracle, for the healing. And Jesus said to him, behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. And so certainly there's a, uh, a teaching there that sometimes uh, you can be sick, and it's, it's every, every sickness is not a direct punishment from God because you've done something. Uh, and uh, we could discuss that for a long time. But God does not work it that uh, every time you uh, have a bad thought or something, you get an instant pain or you fall down or he strikes you. God is merciful. He's long suffering. And, uh, but this man may have, I don't know how he got crippled. Uh, was he stealing? And as he ran away from the theft, he, he broke his leg. Was he doing something bad? Uh, but Jesus tells him to be grateful to God. And he says, uh, sin no more. So in Jesus' divinity, he saw, uh, it sounds like the, the man may have been up to something. Or maybe he stole while he was sick. Because he thought, you know, how else can I get food? And their problem, but Jesus says, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. In other words, when God blesses us, let us be thankful and try to live a life showing that shows gratitude for God's mercy. Beautiful. Well, verse 17, my father worketh unto uh, hitherto, and I work. So uh, Jesus, again, shows that the Sabbath, you can do good on the Sabbath. And we translate that. Many Christians have great fights about the Lord's Day. Uh, certainly, we should worship on the Lord's Day. The, in the Old Testament, they worshiped on the Sabbath, remembering the rest of creation. In the New Testament, we worship on the Lord's Day, remembering the rest of redemption and the Lord's Raised, being raised from the dead on the first day of the week. So we should worship on this day. We don't worship on Saturday. So you can worship every day. Now, after the healing, you see, in the first eight, uh, 19, well, 18 verses, I would like to call your attention to the theology that follows the healing. You know, I don't know the older people in the group might remember the song, after the ball was over, after the crowd went home. And so there's, there's a thought of that, after the ball was over, I'm not a singer. But after the healing, Jesus three times says, verily, verily, which is the English translation, the Greek text of John, 19, John chapter 5, verse 19, verse 24, verse 25, where it says, verily, verily, the Greek text says, amen, amen. The Greek New Testament says, amen, amen is, of course, is Hebrew, not Greek, but uh, the, the John gives us uh, the, the very words that Jesus used, apparently. And when Jesus says, amen, it's important. And in the occasions where our blessed Lord said amen twice, amen, amen. You know, amen, uh, we end the prayer is the last word. It means in Hebrew, I believe, or it is true, depending on the tense. This is, this is the true statement we need to pay attention. So as we have time, I want to notice the six amens of John chapter five. Now they're in three pairs. Amen, 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 amen. And in the new, in the King James, it says verily, verily, verily. It comes from veritas in Latin, which is true. And verily means true, true. But however you want to say it, amen, amen, verily, verily. 
this is really important. If it doesn't strike you as important, remember it is important because our Lord is saying it twice. Amen, amen. Verse 19. I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. Now, I think what he's saying is, he's basically saying, they're saying, you know, you can't heal in the Sabbath. And the Lord says, no, the father does good on the Sabbath. I do good on the Sabbath. And it's all right to do good. You can follow and do good on the Sabbath. Amen, amen. The son can, I said to do nothing of himself. What I, he's saying is, I'm not here to start a new religion. The father is the God of the Old Testament. Of course, the God of the New Testament. And he says, whatever the father does, I do. In other words, whatever the God of the Old Testament did, that's my religion. That's my God. That's the creator. That's the one I am one with. And we have every now and then false messiahs who want to start a new religion. We have people, false Christ, and they want to save the world with uh, communism or or something like that. We have the Hitlers and the Mao's, German Mao, who are false Stalin, false Christ. And we have religious false Christ who start teaching uh, something new that's apart from the Bible. And Jesus is really affirming that by my healing on the Sabbath, I'm not starting something new. I'm doing what the Father always does. He does good and holy acts on the Sabbath, and that's what I do. And I can do nothing uh, uh, of himself, but what the Father does. This is not a, a, a new religion, a new start, e even to the cross. It's the Father's will. And so uh, the Pharisees who object that Jesus is breaking the law of the Old Testament, Jesus says, no. I'm really fulfilling the law because I do what the Father does. And uh, I'm in line with him and in harmony and with his holiness. Verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Well, you see, after explaining that he is in harmony with the God of the Old Testament and that it's good to do good works on the Sabbath, whether you equate the Sabbath, it's not quite the Lord's day, but now he, I think he's telling the people that are around listening, and these words will be repeated for 2,000 years. Hey. He that believes on me, and believes on him that sent me. See, if you believe on Jesus, you believe on the one who sent him. Notice him who sent me. It's very important to realize that Jesus was sent by God the Father in the plan of salvation from eternity. Jesus is not an independent Messiah or starting an independent religion. He was sent by God. That means if you reject Jesus, you're rejecting the one whom the Father sent, and you're rejecting God. And, uh, but the good news is that he that believeth on him hath everlasting life, and shall not con come into condemnation. You know, we all sin. We're all sinners. Some people are horrible sinners. Maybe this guy was a horrible sinner before he had this uh, uh, problem. 
And uh, the wonderful news is if we trust in Christ, he has paid for our sins and our sins are forgiven. And when we don't have to stand in front of the white throne judgment and be condemned by God for our sins because Jesus has paid for them. And we certainly invite anyone hearing, if you don't know Christ as your savior, that even now you say, oh Lord, forgive me for my sins. I trust in Christ as the one who died for me. Because if you believe in Jesus, he has guaranteed that, that you will have everlasting life and not be condemned at the judgment. You know, life is short. Some of the young people might gasp. My birthday is in a couple of days. I don't know if I should say how old I am. I'm about to be 87 in a week, less than a week. You know, in my mind, I still feel young. And when I talk to people, I internally still feel young. I talk to an older person. I feel like I'm still a young person. And uh, uh, life goes quickly. That's what I'm saying. Life goes quickly. And isn't it wonderful that Jesus says, verily, verily, you know, if you can count on this, trust in Jesus and you have eternal life. Well, none of us want to be sick. We don't want to die. But what a comfort it is to know that we have everlasting life, that we, you die and you go right into the presence of the Lord and uh, you'll come back with him. Then verse 25, the third time. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so shall he hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Now, this is something you'd like to meditate, meditate on this today. The Father, God the Father, Jesus tells us has life, and he says, amen, amen, this is true. He has life in himself. John chapter one says of the Son, in him was life. We are created and we have a birthday. The, the earth came into being, the sun came into being, and if I can say it, the sun has a birthday, the moon has a birthday, the earth has a birthday, or, but the God, the Father, has eternality. In other words, I've, I've often said the basic law of science in our world is that everything must have an adequate cause. And for young people, when they try to say there's no God or evolution, everything must have an adequate cause. Nothing happens without an adequate cause, no exceptions. However, who made the world? Well, God made the world. Well, then who made God? And the laws of our science forbid any existence. By if everything needs an adequate cause, then who made God? Who made the Big Bang? Uh, it doesn't work because there's a set of rules outside of our limited science and rules where God has eternality. God always was. We can't explain it. We just have to say there is a supernatural. There is a God. There is an eternity. And praise God that that God is holy. And that God said, gee, he loved us. And that God does well all the days of the week. And uh, our blessed Lord, he was the good shepherd and he died for our sins. Amen and amen. And God bless you, our beloved friends.